The following program is brought to you by Caltech. So next up we have a panel and uh, you met him this morning. Professor Deshay is going to host the panel. Um, so Professor Deshay, there you are. Come on up, you're the next contestant. No, that was a joke. Okay, um, the format here is we're going to have um, three different talks. The talks are approximately 10 minutes each, although I've learned over time that um, restricting Caltech professors to 10 minutes can be a challenge, <laughs> so we'll see. Um, after the talk, I will open the floor briefly, uh, you know, if anybody has a, a burning question that they really want to ask right away, um, I'll open the floor briefly for questions for a few minutes after each talk, so, uh, you know, questions that pop up during the talk can be answered quickly. And then after all three uh, of these talks are done, then I will, uh, we'll all go and sit in front and, and have more of an extended panel discussion where you can ask questions relating to any one of the talks or intersections between the talks or, you know, whatever you may wish to ask about. So that's the format and uh, without cutting any more into speaker's time than I already have, let me introduce the first speaker. The first speaker is uh, Shuo Shan. She's uh, a professor of chemistry at Caltech. She did her, um, her uh, prior training, her bachelor's degree at University of Maryland. She then um, went to do her PhD degree in the biochemistry department at Stanford, up in, you know, a, a reasonably good university up north in Palo Alto. And uh, she worked with Dan Hirschlag. And uh, then she went to um, uh, Fantastic Medical School to do her postdoc. I'm only saying that because I did my postdoc at the same place. At University of California, San Francisco, where she worked with uh, Peter Walter. And in Peter Walter's lab, she began to uh, undertake uh, very highly quantitative studies on how uh, protein molecules are targeted to the right part in the cell after they're synthesized. And uh, she has become, in general, very interested in, in what I would call the field of protein homeostasis, which is, you know, how proteins are born and how they're managed after their birth uh, in order for them to execute their proper functions. And that's become a very important area in translational medicine because it's, it's come to be appreciated that uh, not only uh, are defects in those processes at the root of a number of different metabolic diseases, but also uh, are probably contributory in cancer as well as neurodegenerative disease. And so uh, Shuo will describe to us uh, the fundamental studies that she's done in this area and uh, perhaps how they might relate to translational medicine. And uh, Shuo? Um, thank you all for being here. And uh, now the theme of this session is how basic research inspires new medicine. So I will start by discussing some of the most fundamental cellular processes. That is, as Ray said, the proper production and balance of all our cellular proteins. So every second, whoa, what happened? So every second, tens of thousands of new proteins are made in almost every cell around the planet. And these proteins then go on to become the building blocks and workhorses that sustain our life. For example, they build our muscles. They become the collagen fibers that comprise our hair, nail, and joints. And over 95% of proteins are, in one form or another, enzymes that carry out the myriad of biochemical transformations in our body. So it's easy to appreciate that the making of proteins is extremely important. But much less appreciated is probably the fact that 
When a new protein is born in the cell, it's just a linear chain of amino acids. Uh, much like uh, a lot of tender love and attention goes into the development of an infant into an adult, um, many cellular processes must happen efficiently and accurately to ensure that this chain of amino acids actually mature into a functional protein. So these um, early decisions will actually influence how this chain of amino acids can fold into the correct three-dimensional structures, where in the cell they are going to go so that it's in the right environment to gain the right fold, how they then interact with other proteins with nucleic acids or with small molecules to assemble into larger structures and gain new functions, and last but not least, how soon can they be cleared away if that process becomes necessary? Now the proper balance and functioning of all of these processes together comprise the concept that we call protein homeostasis in the cell. And this is the broad umbrella of issues we're interested in and work on. And these things are not only important and interesting for scientists to think about, but are also vastly important for the society at large, because increasingly we realize that mistakes can happen in this process that perturb this homeostasis. And these mistakes not only deprive the cell of functional proteins, but can also lead to the misfolding of the protein, or even worse, uh, the formation of large protein aggregates. And these are mistakes, mistakes that lead to devastating consequences. So here's a beautiful brown eye of a young person. Now that's the eye of a cataract patient. So what happens here is that the crystalline protein that make up our eye lenses have you know, refused to stay in solution after decades of use and have decided to crash out and form large aggregates. Now here's a slice of a hippocampus from an Alzheimer's patient. And instead of clear slice that you should have seen, what you see instead are these large protein deposits formed by an amyloid beta um, protein fragment. Now, of course, we're still debating whether these large protein deposits are actually causal to the disease. But it's generally agreed that somewhere during the process where this protein fragment converts into these large aggregated structures are highly toxic cells or toxic processes to the cell and causes massive neuronal death. And the past decade has just seen a rising number of human ailments that are either linked to or shown to be rooted in these um, mishaps of protein folding. You can ask, how do you solve these problems? And a lot of attempts have been you know, dedicated based on well-founded principles to either stabilize that native protein fold or to inhibit the cellular processes that can lead to the misfolding or aggregation of the protein. And in a few limited cases, those efforts have been successful or promising. But by and large, honestly, there isn't a ready solution to these problems yet. Now, as Caltech alumni, a lot of you are probably familiar with the teaching of George Polia that if you can't solve a problem yet, first identify a related problem that is soluble. And the related question that you can ask instead is, how do cells deal with this problem? And how do they overcome the challenges of protein aggregation and misfolding? Because after all, these are challenges that the cell have to dis um, encounter all the time. Now, Ray can tell you a lot about, or probably already did, about cellular mechanism to clear damaged proteins. And the first um, line of defense that cell has against this problem are actually a group of proteins called molecular chaperones. And much like human chaperones, molecular chaperones prevent the improper interactions between proteins from happening that can lead to these mishaps. And by doing so, they guide the proteins through the most productive folding, assembly, and localization pathways. And a special group of molecular chaperones can even reverse existing protein aggregates. And I'll come back to them a little later. Now, some proteins are harder than others to handle, and arguably, um, the most challenging class of proteins that chaperones have to deal with are those proteins that, distinct, that are distinct for a cellular membrane. And this is just one of the examples that we study. So this is the most abundant membrane protein on this planet, those that comprise the light harvesting complex. 
And uh, if you just look at the, the electrostatic potential of this thing, you quickly realize that this, these, this is a very greasy protein with very little surface charges to interact properly with water. So these are proteins that are meant to sit in our cellular membrane. But before they get there, they have to cross at least one, and in the case of this protein, two aqueous compartments in the cell where they are highly prone to aggregation and misfolding. And that's our first-hand experience with this problem. So this is how I kind of got interested in these um, questions because we were trying to figure out in the bi route, how this class of hugely important and highly abundant proteins in the cell can actually get to the membrane destinations without the mishaps of aggregation. And during this process, my student found out that en route to the membranes, these light harvesting complexes are very effectively protected by a novel chaperone in plants called the chloroplasts P43. So I know the names are very nondescript, so I'm just going to call this our little chaperone. So this is um, the kind of only data you have to see, and the principle is pretty simple. If a protein form huge aggregates, they scatter a lot of light, which you can easily read out in any photometric device. And these membrane proteins are so prone to aggregation, as, they, as soon as they see an aqueous solution, it aggregates spectacularly. But in the presence of this little chaperone, all this aggregation can be effectively um, protected or prevented. And this is so effective that we got a little bolder. We then asked, what if um, we let this protein aggregate first and then put back our chaperone? Will it be able to reverse this process? I didn't really expect it to work, but it did, and most beautifully. So within a few minutes, we saw that this aggregate can be cleared. And in fact, this restored the competence of the climb protein to be properly inserted back into the cellular membrane. But we then spent the next three years figuring out what the molecular mechanism is behind this process. We are far from done yet, but these studies do allow us to show that our little chaperone works by a highly active mechanism where it can recognize the aggregate via specific molecular interactions. They actually collaborate with each other to invade into and remodel the aggregate that eventually leads to the collapse of this aggregate and their return to soluble complexes. Now, this is very unexpected, and how surprising it is can be seen by comparing this little chaperone with all these other systems that have been seen before to display this type of disaggregate activity. Now, in terms of the efficiency and time scale with which they act, all these systems are on par with each other. But these other systems are really huge molecular assemblies that exceed half a megadalton, and every time they pull a protein out of the aggregate, they burn a ton of cellular fuel in, fo in the form of ATP molecules, whereas this little chaperone is barely 1 20th of their size, and its action is independent of external energy input. And a lot of these differences can be traced back to the different ways with which these chaperone systems interact with their client proteins. You kind of have to remember that this little chaperone sort of co-evolved with the emergence of light harvesting complex on this planet. So this is a chaperone that's dedicated to handling this hugely abundant and highly important class of proteins on Earth. And because of that dedication, it has plenty of time during evolution to build elaborate molecular interactions with its climb protein. And that's not possible with these other devices, which are meant to be general chaperones to handle a variety of proteins with different size and shape and amino acid composition. And because they can't build any good interaction with any climb protein, the most sensible strategy that they can resort to is to form an elaborate structure that can use mechanical forces from ATP hydrolysis to do their job. Now, this is a very small example, but it's very typical of basic research where nature here teaches us a new possibility that we have not thought about before. And that is, if you can dedicate a chevron towards a specific clan protein and build aggregate interactions between them, those interactions are actually sufficient to reverse a pretty stable aggregate. And it actually doesn't take a very big protein fold to do it. Now, 
and as basic research often goes, these are findings that raise a lot more questions. Precisely how does this little chaperon work, and can we understand it to the extent that we can make accurate predictions? Um, how many other systems in the cell actually harbor this kind of activity that we haven't looked into? And the last but not least is this tantalizing possibility that if we understand how these systems work, how would they then teach us about new strategies and possibilities to deal with um, putting aggregation problems that are related to human health. A few very specific examples being, can chemists build molecular scaffold that mimic the action of this chaperone, or can protein engineers then take this scaffold and direct it against alternative substrates? So I will leave it at that and thank the students and postdocs who have contributed to this work, especially Pierre Sazu Ampopon, who is just so brave to work with an insoluble protein and really lay the foundation of all of this. And uh, I thank you all for being here and uh, we'll be happy to discuss all the specifics. We can take one or two questions. This, shop, this project has not yet been funded, actually, federally. Yeah. It's fortunate we got a little fund, bridging funding from the American Aging Society, but that's right. How does the chaperone give up the protein so it can uh, marry the membrane or whatever? So eventually, everything's driven by thermodynamics, right? Um, um, the interaction of this protein with the membrane is much stronger than uh, the interaction with the chaperone. So there's principally no thermodynamic problem to that process. Now, one of the features of chaperones, which makes them interesting but difficult to study, is that their interaction with the clamp proteins are extremely dynamic. They bind and release um, and their, their clients very quickly. So it's these rapid binding and release cycles that allow constant sampling and partitioning of the client protein. Yes? So I get the impression that this chaperone protein either causes a conformal change or morphological change in the structure of the protein itself, probably the blue. And it makes me wonder how many degrees of freedom there are in protein molecules. So are we talking about um, <laughs> You know, single molecules that usually have thousands of degrees of freedom, millions of degrees of freedom, or tens of degrees of freedom. In terms of the numbers of ways they can refold themselves you know, and be catalyzed to have new functionality, either by chaperone or other ones. So that's the event, um, initial Levanthal puzzle that was um, proposed, right? In that if you think about the degree of freedom that the protein chain can have, and the number of time to um, sample them will exceed the number of uh, the time that the universe has existed. But a lot of it um, ignore the fact that if you look at the protein chain, um, there are only a few degrees of freedom that they can reasonably you know, uh, assume in, <laughs> in a stable way. And uh, another thing that um, to keep in mind is that um, <laughs> is that it's not like there's only one specific rotational um, um, vibrational degrees of angle of the chain for every atom that the chaperone can bind. It probably um, recognizes an ensemble of structures. And as long as those ensembles are rati rapidly equilibrating with each other, conformational selection should be enough to do that job, if that makes sense. So the next speaker is uh, going to be Pamela Bjorkman. Pamela took her uh, undergraduate degree, um, it says University of Oregon, but I thought you got your undergraduate degree at Reed College. No, I couldn't afford one. You couldn't afford Reed College. <laughs> so it is the University of Oregon. Uh, I've known Pamela for a long time and I just learned something new. Um, yeah, she then went to uh, get her PhD at Harvard where she worked with Don Wiley. And as a graduate student, she did what uh, has really become a famous experiment in biology by determining the crystal structure of 
uh, what's known as the uh, major histocompatibility uh, antigen uh, 1 bound to a peptide that that MHC molecule presents to the immune system. And in that one experiment, she uh, shed tremendous light on how our immune system distinguishes self from non-self. She really established a molecular basis because that's what MHC does. It presents peptides and that the immune system could look at those peptides and determine whether those peptides are peptides that were encoded by your natural proteins or by an invader like a virus. After she did that work, she went to do a postdoc at Stanford uh, with Mark Davis, again, working on uh, T cell receptors and, and recognition of, of MHC complexes. And after her postdoc with Mark, she came down here to assume her faculty position. Uh, she's been here since, I'm guessing, 88 or 89. And uh, during that time, she's won uh, a boatload of awards. And uh, if I were to recite them, I'd cut significantly into her time. So I'll just name a couple of them. Um, she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. She won the, um, the L'Oreal UNESCO uh, Women in Science Award in 2006. And one here that I really liked was she was named among the most powerful moms in science, technology, engineering, and math in Working Mother magazine in 2011. <laughs> uh, you know, Pamela's really had an extraordinary career here at Caltech, as evidenced by the, the, the work that she's done and the recognition that work has garnered, and uh, I welcome her to give her presentation. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I wanted to talk about today, I'd like to introduce with what everyone would like to do to solve really a global problem today, and that is the prevalence of HIV infection that leads to um, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or AIDS. So what we really need is a vaccine so that this would cease to be a problem. And the way vaccines generally work is that you inject something into somebody, and it's a mimic of the pathogen. So in this case, this is a depiction of the HIV, the virus itself, and it's got proteins on its surface. And then your immune system says, oh, this isn't supposed to be here, and it starts to raise antibodies. And I'll be talking about antibodies throughout this presentation, but those are shown here in floating around in your blood, and they're all different from each other. And the idea would be that some of these antibodies would bind to the virus and prevent it from ever infecting. And so that's the way you would be protected, say, against polio, let's say, or if you get flu shots every year, this is how this works. And it hasn't worked yet for a variety of reasons. And this is really a tragedy because this is what we're dealing with right now. This is the prevalence of HIV infection in the world. There are 34 million people at the end of 2011 living with HIV, and so, sometimes it's progressed to AIDS. So we all know that there are effective antiretroviral drugs. These are small molecule drugs that you can be given if you're um, diagnosed as HIV positive. And this picture should tell you that it's just not working. It's working in certain parts of the world, which would be the developed world, such as where we live. It's working pretty well so that people can live a fairly normal life if they're taking these drugs. They do have side effects. But they work for most people. But it is simply not working, especially in areas of sub-Saharan Africa, where in some communities, you have like a 60% chance of being HIV positive by the time you're in your mid-20s. So this is just appalling, and something needs to be done about it. So why can't we just raise antibodies against HIV? And why can't we do something about this problem? Because the small molecule drugs aren't working that well in parts of the world. Okay, so I wanted to introduce antibodies. These are proteins, I said, they're in your blood. And they come in a huge number of different varieties. So we have genetic mechanisms that are fascinating that um, I won't have time to describe, but you have the capacity to make all these different types of antibodies. And it's been estimated maybe 10 to the power of 16 
different kinds of antibodies. So whatever you're infected with, it could be a new virus, it could be a new bacterium or a fungus or whatever, you should be able to make antibodies that will clear it. So you're always safe if your immune system can actually make effective antibodies. So the antibodies look like this. This is the result of a crystal structure, which is a way to localize all the atoms in a protein, even a protein. You know, proteins aren't that big. This is bigger than Shuo's little chaperone. It's like a 10 nanometers in uh, length here. Uh, so it's a bit bigger than hers, but really proteins are quite small, but we're able to visualize where all the atoms are and do chemistry on these proteins. Okay, so what happens when someone gets infected with HIV? Well, they make antibodies, but most of those antibodies are ineffective in the case of most people. So it's been estimated that maybe of, of the people who are infected, maybe 5 to 10 percent of people who are infected would develop what are called broadly neutralizing antibodies. And what that means is these are antibodies that could deal with any form of HIV that arises in that person. So the really horrible thing about an HIV infection is there are thousands of different viruses in a single person because the virus rapidly mutates. Of course it does this on purpose. And every time it mutates, the antibodies you raised are no good anymore against the new virus. So that's what happens to 95% of the people. They make antibodies, that's fine. But those antibodies don't work against the thousands of different viruses that they make, that there are circulating in their system now. So there would be more HIV, more types of HIV in a single person than there are types of influenza in the world. So it's really a problem for your immune system to deal with. But there are these unusual people, and they're being studied a lot. Uh, so there's something about them where they make what are called broadly neutralizing antibodies, where their antibodies, like some of them, for some reason, will neutralize 95, 90 percent of all viruses, so maybe 90 percent of the viruses. So these people are, something different is going on in their case. And these antibodies are really interesting because if you, passively give them, that is, you inject those antibodies that have already been made, they will protect a non-human primate in an animal model of HIV infection. So you give them the antibodies ahead of time, they won't get infected. So that says if we could make a vaccine that would induce those antibodies, it would probably work. The problem is making the vaccine and finding what you have to inject to make those antibodies. So a number of people have been thinking there might be another way. And that way might be to, for example, either just inject the antibodies themselves, which would, you'd have to make a lot of protein to do that, and it might be very expensive, but you could do that, I think. Or you could do gene therapy to deliver the genes for the antibodies against HIV to a person, and then they would continually make those proteins themselves by tran um, transcribing and translating the gene. <laughs> so the way this would work is that you'd have some kind of vector that would deliver the gene to the person's cells, and then the gene would make the protein, and the protein you'd be making is um, some kind of protein against HIV, uh, an anti-HIV neutralizing <laughs> antibody or an antibody-like protein. And then if this worked properly, you'd get a long-term supply, years, maybe decades, of anti-HIV antibodies. And this is something that, for example, David Baltimore's lab is working on, uh, these viral vector sorts of approaches. What we're trying to do is design whatever it is that would go into those vectors. And we would like to make improved versions of the antibodies that exist already that have been isolated from these few rare individuals that happen to make broadly neutralizing antibodies. So what we're trying to do is make them more broadly neutralizing and more potent. So I'll show you two ways we're trying to do that. And the first one is going to be a rational, structure-based design way. And the second way is more of a, a shot-in-the-dark type of way. Okay. So the first way we're doing that is simply looking at what the antibodies look like when they're actually bound to uh, an HIV protein. So what I'm going to show you now is a movie of a structure of part of the antibody bound to part of the HIV. Okay, so the nomenclature here, you don't have to care about this nomenclature, but the antibody has a name which is NIH 4546. Sorry about that, but it was isolated from a person whose name is patient 45, and it must have been the 46th time they tried to get it. And it was done with National Institutes of Health funding. <laughs> 
And then the viral protein is called GP120, which means glycoprotein 120. So what you're going to see in this um, movie is the bottom is the viral protein, GP120, and the top is the antibody bound. And the antibody is mimicking the natural receptor for HIV, which is a molecule called CD4. So the way HIV gets into your cells is it binds to CD4. But if this antibody called NIH4546 in blue is there, it blocks CD4 from binding. So it's a simple thing to understand. You, the virus can't get in because the antibody is blocking it from interacting with its receptor. Okay, so it's a mimic. The antibody is a mimic of the, of the CD4 receptor. But CD4 has a trick. It has a phenylalanine here, which is a large hydrophobic side chain. It's an amino acid that is hydrophobic. And it fits into a conserved pocket on GP120 that is sort of hydrophobic itself. That is, it's greasy. And so this side chain fits into hydrophobic pockets. And this antibody right here has nothing. It has no side chain there. It happens to have a glycine, which is one of the 20 amino acids that has no side chain whatsoever. So it doesn't make a very good interface. So we thought, actually Ron Diskin in the lab thought, I can improve that. So what he did was he just introduced, using recombinant DNA technology, he took the gene for the antibody and introduced a hydrophobic residue right at this position. And then he made that antibody and he tested it. So now I'm going to show you these are called coverage curves, what happened when he made those mutants, that mutant. So what you're looking at here is the percent of HIV strains that are neutralized at a certain concentration. So if you look at this black curve right here, what it means is that if you, so the lower the concentration that you neutralize, the better, right? So you want to be way to the left on this curve. And then you want to neutralize all strains eventually, so you want to go up as far as possible. So you want to be over to the left and you want to eventually neutralize all strains. So you look at this black antibody right here and 27% of strains are neutralized at a concentration of 0.1 microgram per mil. And that's what we're aiming for to be able to do these therapies. So that's just a rule of thumb concentration. So we'd like the antibodies to be more potent than that. And this one neutralizes about 90% of strains. So NIH4546 is the antibody in red that we started with, and it gets all the, it gets 43% um, of the strains at 0.1 microgram per mil, and then this is just a comparison antibody. So these green, red, and black antibodies are being considered for therapy. And here are some of the mutants we've made. And so they're a lot more potent. They're, they're so potent that we don't even go to low enough concentrations in, in the case of some strains. And then the thing that's really encouraging is that we've increased the coverage of strains so that in the case of one of our mutants, we're only missing 3% of the strains that we're testing. So we think that's really important to increase the coverage and also to make them more potent because now it will work at lower concentrations. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to sort of in general, this is sort of a longer term project that we really need to solve if we're going to use these antibodies in an effective way. So here's an antibody, and it has two identical arms, and each of these binds to something. And the thing that it binds is called an antigen. Okay, so the antibody, just like you, would do a lot better if it was trying to hang on to something if it had two arms that could bind. Okay, so here ELMO is binding. These are actually influenza proteins that ELMO is binding from. But you can think of it as trying to hang off of a bar at the gym, let's say. You're going to do better if you use two hands. And here's, these are influenza proteins, and here's influenza virus. And it's got all kinds of spikes. They're called uh, spike proteins here. These are actually when you talk about strains like H5N1 and so on. This is, this is actually the H in H5, this spike right here. And that's the, that's the H right there, this blue protein. Okay, so if an antibody were binding to the surface of influenza virus, it's probably going to look like this. So it's got two adjacent spikes. They're pretty close together because there's lots of spikes, and so the antibody's going to bind like that. And it's going to be able to hang on. So now let's look at what HIV looks like. It doesn't have very many spikes, and the ones that it has are spread out. So this, they're about the same size here. They're both about 100 nanometers in diameter. 
flu has 440, 450 spikes. HIV has an average of 14, which is really low. Viruses don't usually look like this. And they're generally too far apart, so most of the antibodies are gonna bind like that, using only a single arm. And as the, as the viral spike protein mutates, it's not gonna be able to hang on anymore. If it could hang on like this, then maybe the virus could mutate and it would still be there and hanging on and doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is present, preventing the infection. So this is what we're trying to do with those antibodies. As we're improving their individual arms, we're trying to improve their general structure so that they would work better. So the idea is we want to remove all the problems with the spikes being too far apart. So not only are they far apart, but they're spaced at variable distances. So we can't ever make a reagent that would be able to reach between all spikes, because the spikes on different viruses are different distances apart. So instead, we, we try to make something that would bind to a single spike. So the two arms don't work the way an antibody normally is, but maybe we could lengthen them so that they could bind to a single spike. Or maybe we could make three arms instead of two. And then, or maybe we could make six arms. This is a six arm um, version of an antibody. So that this would be the arm of the antibody, the hand right here. And then we just connect it um, to six possibilities. And we have got to get the geometry right so that this actually works. But if you had something like that, then I think that the virus could mutate all it wanted to. And I believe that these would still be bound. So I think this might be a general way of solving this problem. And I'd like to just end with, so we haven't solved the problem yet, but we're working on it. We have a lot of design ideas and sort of library approaches for screening and so on. And we're sort of partway there. But I want to show you what I think could be done now that would be, a, that would be quite interesting. So in 2005 or so, people did a clinical trial where they took the best broadly neutralizing antibodies they had at the time, which had these names right here, and they injected them into HIV-infected volunteers who were on antiretroviral therapy. And these people voluntarily took a drug holiday, so they got off their antiretroviral therapy. And as soon as you do that, your virus comes back up. It's 100% of the time that always happens. But if, if one group was given these antibodies, it delayed the viral rebound after they stopped their antiretroviral therapy. So it delayed it, but it didn't prevent it. But I'd like to show you on that coverage curve what those antibodies were. They were right here in terms of their potency and their breadth. And we, in, the, in the eight years since this, this study was done, we've got antibodies that look like this. They're 100 to 1,000 times more potent, and they're reaching almost 100% of the strains. So I think that this should be redone. And if it could delay it longer or even indefinitely, this might be something that we could do until we find the absolute ideal reagent to, to use against HIV. Thanks. I, I have a question for you. So is, has, I assume this has been tried and perhaps hasn't worked, but maybe you can comment on it. If you're trying to get antibodies that mimic um, how the virus binds to CD4, is it feasible to start in a different direction and just start with CD4 itself as a soluble fragment and express that as essentially a decoy protein that yeah. the virus would latch onto instead of binding to CD4 in cell membranes? So that's certainly been tried and that's actually been put into people and it does not work. And it's, it's quite, it's really too bad. It should work in theory, and it just doesn't. The antibodies are better than CD4. Is it clear why it doesn't work? Uh, there's some ideas that it induces GB120 to shed from HIV, and then you have all this decoy protein floating around, and the antibodies may act in some different way. But the antibodies are actually more effective than just soluble CD4, and that's been used as FC fusions, and all kinds of things. And then if you, if you multimerize it to make it better, there's a tetrameric version of it. I would, you know, CD4 really has a function. It's supposed to bind to class two MHC molecules. And I would worry about that reagent. It would bind to 
self proteins and do strange things, I would think. Mm. So, unfortunately, that doesn't work. There was a question here. Yeah. So, is this applicable to other viruses? Um, in general, trying to improve the antibodies against them is applicable, and we're trying to do that for influenza. We just started a project on that. But a lot of times you don't need to do this. I mean, you can, you can get your own body to raise effective antibodies against measles, let's say, so we have a vaccine. Um, there are a lot of, there's no reason to do it if, if your body will do it. From some work I did in immunoassays, I got the impression that in that world, antibody generation, there's a whole bunch of different ways to generate antibodies that you hope will be effective with the antigen you're trying to detect. And here you've laid out a pathway that is, in my mind, driven in part by PCAM, by structure. And that seemed to be a very difficult route in the immunoassay world. Is there something different about those two worlds that makes it more or less difficult in the HIV domain or with the antigen you're looking at there, or perhaps the immunoassay world that I'm working in is not as talented as well, you're expressing? If you raise, if you inject HIV proteins to make antibodies, you'll make them, but they will generally be strain specific and they won't be much use. And so what's been done, that was done for 10, 20 years, and a few antibodies <coughs> came out that were reasonably good. But now there are ways of, of actually cloning out the genes from broadly neutralizing antibodies from these very rare people. And so some people, for some reason, can make quite good antibodies. And so we're starting with those antibodies that already are very good. And then we're trying to improve them so that we study how the virus escapes from them. Because the virus will, even though they're good, the virus will escape from them. That's by definition it will. But then we look at how it escapes, and then we design against that route of escape. So that's how, actually, we increased the levels here. This was a direct, uh, we got up to that purple line here by saying, OK, we know, we know what's going to happen when we inject NIH 4546 and let the virus mutate in response to it. We know what's, what the virus is going to mutate to. And now we design against that, so it will not be allowed. So that's where we're going. And, and we're, we're not trying to start from scratch to isolate the animal. 